the next uh, talk is in an area that I'm kind of actually very concerned with. Um, as we have multiple pieces of a technology, uh, not just the normal networking data path process packets, it's important that we have well-documented and easy-to-use ways to capture packets. Uh, this includes normal networking path, BPF-based technologies like XDP, and hardware offloading like switches and stuff like that. So I hope that uh, as we develop different pieces of infrastructure, we can uh, solve this problem in a reasonable way. And uh, I'd like to pass the microphone to Alan McGuire, who's working on BPF packet capture and infrastructure for that. So please give a round of applause for Alan. OK, um, can you hear me OK, guys? Yeah. OK, so what we're going to be doing is sprinkling a bit of BPF magic on the process of tapping packets for observability. So, so that's the plan. Um, so first of all, we'll talk a little bit about the roots of BPF, which I think are, have often been, been covered before. Um, so BPF was kind of born in a time of crisis. So the, the founding of this work was at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs team. The network research group there were diagnosing and fixing the congestion collapse of the ARPANET. And uh, the tools of the day weren't really up to scratch, and they didn't do much in the way of protocol decoding or filtering. Um, so some of the tools they built, there's a great presentation by Steve McCann, um, who's one of the co-authors on the original BPF paper. And he talked, there's one slide in that which, which is kind of stunning. It's, it's a list of all the different technologies they, they, they worked on and all the tools they built. And some of the examples are TCP dump lib, PCAP, trace route, and patch are. And it, it's sort of, you know, a lot of these tools dated from the late 80s, and whenever technology endures, it's impressive, but the amount of technology that they built is, is, is really stunning. Um, and I, it's worth mentioning, actually, in a sort of sad note in, 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 from, about that team, um, that Sally Floyd passed away. She was one of the pioneers in that team. Um, she she um, invented the, the red detection algorithm, and uh, one paper that, of hers I think is fantastic. It's really worth a read, and is a real model of communication, which is always difficult in our field. Um, is it's what's the paper called now? It's um, why I think it's called why um, simulating the internet is hard. Um, and when you look through that paper, um, the introduction, she, you could give that to someone you know knew nothing about internet technology, and within five minutes they'd understand a lot of the core ideas in our field. So it's a real, um, I think it's a real tribute to her ability as a teacher. So. What we're going to be talking about a bit more today, though, is um, the paper by McCann and Jacobson, which was the origins of the BPF work. Um, and obviously, one of the challenges they faced was they wanted to observe traffic, um, but they didn't want to look at all of it. So in that case, you want to filter traffic. You want to do that in the kernel, though, because you don't want that overhead of user space uh, copy. So we wanted to have a flexible way of describing that filtering process, and we wanted to inject that description into the kernel. So that's called classic BPF, and this is, this is one of the things that happens when you get old. People start calling things classic and retro, and uh, I'm even getting vintage in some of the stuff that I just think of as the thing, you know? It's like um, all these adjectives are popping up all the time. It's kind of frightening. So, um, so yeah, the idea is that, that once these filters are injected, a simple v virtual machine will run the instructions in kernel. And the key thing is safety. So all programs must complete in bounded time, so there's no loops, no, no, backward, um, no backward branching. So. Um, so you can see classic BPF today if you run TCP dump with it with a D option to, to dump out the information, and you, you can see how, how all of that looks. For just a simple filter like TCP, there's a couple of different cases here, like IPv4 and IPv6. And you'll notice some of the magic numbers there, and they'll probably help orient you to that. Um, but of course, we need something to filter. So in the original BPF paper, um, uh, Jackson can talk about the tap and the filter. So the tap is the source of the packets. Um, now, we've had this EBP, EPBF revolution in the last couple of years, which was all about taking that filtering language, extending it, and expanding it to all these different use cases, like XTP for fast packet processing, um, tracing for K-probes, and, and, and so much more. So similarly here, we're going to be going back to that original paper and trying to extend that concept of a tap from a fixed point in the kernel to something a bit more dynamic, using BPF as the means to do so. So I'll just give a quick rundown on how the tap works in today. So, this is, um, if we look at the libppcap code, you can see some of, this, some of this code there. And the kernel size described in the packet mmap um, documentation. So we open a PF packet um, raw socket, um, bind using a link layer address socket with um, the interface index of the interface we're trying to snoop on. And um, from there, um, the kernel will actually um, register some callbacks for when we send and receive traffic. And that's how our, our, our traffic gets up to our, our socket that we're observing on. Um, on the user space side, um, we, we build um, a packet mmap, which is a shared 
kernel user space buffer. Um, and the, the, the big thing about this is that we don't want to generate a system call every time we want to read a packet. So when we have the shared buffer, um, we can poll on that buffer and then read multiple packets at the same time. So um, I've given a couple of references there to, to the code so you can see how that's done for libpcap. Um, so the problem is, though, these days, there's a lot of things going on in the networking stack. Um, we have generic segmentation offload where we take a, a mega packet, pass it through the stack, and then chop it up at the last minute um, to, to minimize overheads. Um, and then GRO, generic receive offload, where we do the opposite, we put it back together. Um, there's also BPF. Obviously, we're, we're modifying packets in BPF these days, too. Um, and when we're dropping traffic, the packet may not even reach the tap, so if we're dropping on the outbound path. So what that all kind of adds up to is when we're debugging, there's no one right answer to the question, where is the best place to observe packets? So some people want to see the drops at K3SKB. Um, they're the, you know, the error code path drops. Some people are going to want to see packets before um, GSO segmentation. Some will want to see them after. Um, and some will want to see them before or after GRO reassembly too. So what I'm suggesting is, um, yeah, so just, just a bit of general um, information on how BPF does things. So it uses helper functions to carry out tasks. Um, particularly in communication with user space, we've got a BPF trace print K, um, which is essentially print K for BPF programs. We've got maps, which are a way for user space and the kernel to communicate, share configuration. You know, we can take stats, we can record stats in those maps. And then we've got, for our purposes, the interesting one, which is BPF per event output. So that, that allows us to record metadata and information in BPF programs. Um, and that, that particular helper works for SKB programs, um, so like TC, um, you know, the, the TC subsystem, XTP programs, and tracing programs as well. And in fact, XTP, XTP cap uses perf events to capture from XTP, so you can do a little bit of that already. Um, so similarly to the case with, with the packet MMAP, these perf events are written to an MMAP shared buffer with user space. Um, and we can poll for updates and read multiple events simultaneously in a similar way without invoking all those overheads. Um, and so what I'm suggesting is we use the same mechanism for the BPF P PCAP helper, so a helper to be specific to doing pa packet capture. In this case, rather than letting the user specify the metadata, we'll specify it ourselves, and we'll specify the information you need to actually capture that data. So it's the protocol type, uh, the packet length, and the capture length, and the capture time, and then the data is the, the packet itself. And as is the case for the BPF per event output helper, I'd, I'd suggest we support it for XTP, SKB, and tracing programs. But the tracing case is the real interesting case because that's the one we can't do as well today. Um, so that's the sort of function signature I'm suggesting. So the first argument is the context of the program in the case of SKB and XTP programs. So that's our struct SKBuff or our XT, XTP metadata. Um, for the tracing programs, it's going to be a pointer to an SKBuff that would be derived from the K probe context. So that would be the arguments to whatever kernel function it is, or the raw trace point arguments. So um, for example, if we call BPF PCAP with the, um, the PT reg as PARM1, that gives us the SKB data pointed to by the first argument to the function we're, we're k-probing. So then the second argument is the maximum length. So one of the things you have to do with the PCAP is when you're opening a capture file, you have to specify what the maximum length of the, the, capture file, the capture, captured packet is going to be. Um, so this allows us to limit the amount of, of data we capture. Um, the third argument is, is the map, which is the perf event map that we set up in user space with a bunch of mmap buffers, and that, that's what allows us to communicate um, send our packet to the right place. Um, and then the protocol is important because if we're moving to this more dynamic model, um, we need to tell, it what, tell um, libpcap what the starting protocol we're dealing with is. So if we're going down through the networking stack, we, could, we may not have appended a layer 2 header yet, so we need to tell it we're, we're capturing at the IP layer. Um, so, so that starting protocol is very important. So the values for that are the same values that are, are used in libpcap. And there's a, I think there's a pcap link type uh, manual page. You can look up to see what those are. But we have, there's values for um, layer two for ethernet. There's values for raw IP, which can be IPv4 and IPv6, et cetera. And then the flags is a final argument. So one of the things I'm suggesting here is that we reserve about 48 bits of the flags for an identifier, which, and the, the point of that is that it would allow us to associate other tracing data with the captured packet and user space if needed. So, you know, that could be a network namespace ID, a process ID, or an index into a stack map. So the stack maps allow us to um, capture stack traces in, in an efficient manner. And um, we can use other bits then to identify what that identifier is effectively as well. Um, now, you don't want to take the process too far. Obviously, you want to give people a, a way to use that identifier in a free form manner as well. Um, but um, having a couple of 
particular identifier flags would be useful. So for example, another case would be if we're capturing from function entry or return or from, from trace points, we don't have any, a network interface associated with that um, in the same way as we do when we capture on a specific device. So one, one option there would be to um, specify an interface index that we, we care about capturing from, and then the capture wouldn't happen if, if it wasn't, if we wouldn't, didn't match that in, index. So another thing you can do with that um, PCAP header, which is what we use as the metadata for the perf event, is use it for, um, uh, oh, sorry, I should first say, yeah, what that is. So um, the PCAP header um, is going to contain a magic number, which allows us, when we're, when we're handling those perf events in user space, we want to be able to identify that they are, it is actually a PCAP event. So, so that magic number does that. And then we have our starting protocol, um, and the ID value, which is from the flags value, which we specified within the BPF program. Um, and then we have the packet length and the amount of data captured and the time of capture as well. Um, and that header can also be used in BPF programs to specify configuration. So you can imagine a case where you wouldn't want to hard code all the information about what protocols you're dealing with. So for example, um, for, if you're tracing K-free SKB, you can be freeing at different levels of the stack. So the starting protocol, which is what the SKB data points to, um, could be IP or it could be layer two. So if you wanted to configure that um, dynamically with your BPF program, you could use um, an array map with a BPF header, um, with this BPF PCAP header, and you could specify all that stuff. Um, so you could specify I care about IP in this case, and I, I care about having packets up to this, this length. Um, so it contains all the information we need to do that specification, so it can be reused as a configuration um, that we push into, into our, our filters as well. So here's a code example. So um, I've, I've omitted the headers, but otherwise this is a, this is a full uh, BPF program. So we're trying to capture um, uh, from a K probe, we're capturing the first argument to that function. Um, and, and we're using that perf event map there. We're, um, we're allocating a perf event map for, uh, and that's gonna be populated in user space with all, all of the um, file descriptors for the MMAP areas. And um, we're capturing at the IP layer as well. So that's pretty straightforward. So, but the other part of this is, of course, if we're capturing all this, we've got to actually, we've got to catch it in user space. So we, we've, got to, we've got to deal with that side of things too. So it, to that end, I, I, I've been trying to think of ways to simplify that process as well. So I'm suggesting one way to do that might be to actually do that within BPF tool itself. Um, so BPF tool describes itself as a tool for inspecting and manipulating BPF programs and maps. Um, and the focus is being able to help and help debug your programs. So packet capture can help with that. Um, one of the areas that I've used this quite a bit for is um, tracing um, checksum errors in BPF programs. So if you do any BPF work with um, packet manipulation, um, you often induce uh, checksum errors. So one of the things you can do if you have a packet capture is you can run it, um, you can run TCP dump or you can run uh, Wireshark in um, uh, check checksum mode. So it will actually tell you what the checksum was and what it should have been. So it's a good way to debug things. Um, so what I'm suggesting is we add a new subcommand to, to PCAP um, to BPF tool, um, but that would requ require lib PCAP and headers. So um, I think that we need an additional feature test for that as well to, to ensure that they're there. So if those features are there, um, we can compile all that stuff in. If not, then, um, then, then, then we're stuck. Um, so there's two modes that I'm suggesting that this, that this uh, PCAP program could work, uh, this PCAP subcommand could work in. So one would be to actually give it a program to capture from, um, and then spe protocol specified in length, so it would scan that program for the perf event map, um, create all our M maps, and populate that perf event map. Um, if there's a, a map containing configuration, so remember I said that we have an array map um, with one of those PCAP headers in where we can tell it which protocols we care about, and we can populate that too. Um, and then it opens the PCAP dump and then polls for perf events and, and, and dumps packets. So similarly, we can do the same thing for tracing programs as well. Um, so the idea here is that we actually, rather than dealing with an existing program that's already loaded, we load and attach um, probes for this particular program. So you can specify a, an object yourself, um, a tracing program yourself, and then specify if you care about K probes or trace points, which probes you're interested in and which arguments you want to capture. Um, and then all the usual stuff about protocols and devices. So one additional thing I'm suggesting here is that we supply a K probe and a trace point object as well. And the idea behind that is that you get some out-of-the-box functionality. So um, you can actually, rather than actually specifying an object in this case, we, we, use, that, um, we use that functionality out-of-the-box to actually um, capture packets. So there's an example of that here. Um, so in this case, we're tracing packets that are dropped at k 3 SKB. 
Um, we just induced an IP tables drop rule, and then we're just going to trigger it to see them. So you can see here we haven't specified a BPF object here, so um, our default object kicks in. Um, we attach our program to the, to the probe point that we specified, and then we can capture it to the capture file. Uh, and um, then we can look at that with Wireshark as well. And the other option is um, we can actually just pipe. Uh, the, the, by default, it sends output to standard out, so we can just pipe the output to TCB dump as well. So that's an example of tracing um, a K probe at one of the um, Wi Fi scan functions. So we can see the, the scan information coming back there. Um, so that's a sort of suggestion how we can approach this. So, future work built on that would be to add this packet capture support to tracing, BFF tracing programs. I mean, what this gives you is the what. So, this tells you what the packet looks like, but you also need the why. So if you have stack traces, if you have other information, you can marry those two pieces of information together, and, and that can be useful. Um, one other area that would be worth looking at is um, adding PCAP-NG support. So um, PCAP-NG is a packet capture format that's been around for a little while now. Um, and one of the nice things about th that format is it allows a mixing of protocol types. So the, the old PCAP format, you're stuck with one protocol type for the whole file. Um, whereas if you imagine, if we're tracing at K-free SKB, for example, we're going to get packets at different levels of the stack. So having that mixing of protocol types is useful there. And the other thing that it, uh, PCAP NG allows um, is it allows you to add annotations and comments. So you can imagine creating a capture file with stack traces or, or other information as well. So marrying those two pieces of information together in the capture file would be useful. Um, so filtering is the other piece of this. Obviously, we have our tap, but we don't have our filter in, in, in this environment. So um, that's something we need to think about moving forward. Um, so would be useful to have a mechanism to enable filters to be able to specify filters to our program before capturing. Um, it might be worth investigating if we can use BPF to BPF calls or, or have a helper program function that we can evaluate the results of a filter um, and, uh, and filter appropriately. And then finally, another area to think about would be, so this is all SKB based. Um, so are there other um, data, data structures that would be useful to trace? So the RDMA stack might be something to, good to look at. Um, uh, the scatter gather lists that are used to specify RDMA data could be um, could perhaps uh, benefit from having a bit more observability. So this might be one, one way to get that, and possibly the USB subsystem as well. I mean, one of the things about Wireshark is we've got dissectors for so many protocols. Um, so if we had ways of interpreting other things other than SK buffs, we could make use of that in other places too. So um, there's some references, and with that, I think I'm done. So if anyone has any questions or comments, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, I'll ask the first question. <laughs> okay, so this is really great. I, I like the fact that you can inspect the SKB state at arbitrary points in time in the kernel with the tracing. That's really useful for debugging especially. But I wonder how we can integrate this in such a way that we can capture packets no matter what thing process them. So like, would you think about applying your infrastructure to XTP-based traffic? that didn't get XTP passed into the networking stack, for example, to pass it into your infrastructure. So you can actually, sorry, one thing I should have been clearer about is um, I kind of focused on the tracing side of things here, but um, you can actually capture in XTP programs as well. Right, that's great. So maybe at some point we consolidate all this stuff such as someone says TCP dump interface ETH0, they get the XTP packets as well as the normal. Oh, OK, so consolidate into the high level too. too yeah, as well. so a yeah. user gets onto a machine, they don't have to know a special tool to look at XTP traffic versus yeah. other traffic. I think that would be a really good direction to go in. Yeah, yeah. And you could imagine in the long term integrating support for specifying functions into the high level tools like TCP dump as well. So you, you could specify kernel function as well. I mean, to be honest, that stuff is probably only going to be used by people like us, kernel developers, and, and people who know what state packets are in at certain points. But um, having sort of high level support for that might be something worth looking at. I think so too. too. Okay, great. Uh, where's the box? Yeah, this is, uh, I, li I like the facility as well. And we've been thinking about something similar to ship something like XTP uh, cap or XTP dump or whatever. Have to, yeah, like a tool specifically for XTP for capturing packets. Yeah. And obviously this helper would be a way. I, um, that, but that I think in terms of integrating with other features, there's also something coming up like in, in the process, the drop monitor, yeah. which can also put point uh, punt packets to user space, yeah, yeah. Uh, but with a different mechanism and a different format. Um, so we might want to think about sort of consolidating this. I'm not sure about like putting PCAP in the kernel. I think you're doing right. Like there's some 
elements of this that puts the actual capture format in the kernel? Well, the nice thing about this is that, well, actually all we really do is capture a contiguous range of data from the packet. Yeah. So it's the user space that takes that and actually dumps it to the capture file. Right, so there's it goes no- into the ring. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But um, and, uh, in terms of the user space tool, uh, I don't think we should be overloading this into BPF tool. Um, I would yeah. much prefer to have sort of a, either an HTTP dump on BPF dump, yeah. or just put it into TCP dump. Yeah. As, as you also said, because they, we're already turning BPF tool into a catch-all tool for yeah. this stuff, and it can be very, very useful outside of sort of the BPF ecosystem. Yeah. This is something we need to have if we're gonna sort of have HTTP and all these things as a supported thing to really need a way to see what's going on. Yeah. So um, re regarding the PCAP format, so like the BPF PCAP helper that you're suggesting, so that would basically add the PCAP header like for every packet and then the actual packet data, right? Yeah. I think it would be good to have this actually programmable. I don't think you would need to have it as a extra helper because yeah. oftentimes maybe um, people want to customize what they want to um, export in terms of metadata. Yeah. Even like with the old BPF um, metadata in front of the packet, there were even multiple formats that a couple of people defined. And I think the original one, for example, didn't even include the if index on that system. And this was like quite some limitation. And I think um, back then Alexei Kuznetsov had its, had its own format, which included that. And so I think it, had, it would have to be programmable. I, it wouldn't make it as a helper itself. Yeah, and if you push the rest into the uh, perf ring buffer anyway, so that's already there, right? So that would be good to yeah have it flexible in the sense. Yeah, I think a lot, one of the things I think it came up actually. Um, I think Young Hong Song um, made this point that you can do a lot of this stuff with perf events already. Um, so you don't. Do you need a specific helper to do this? So the only bit you can't really do, I think, is on the tracing side where you get um, where you have. Uh, Fragments on the SKB, so it's it's easy to do um, do a, pro, a BPF probe read and get get the um, get the head the head head information. But then when there's fragments as well, you're in trouble. So um, definitely, I think keeping things generic. I kind of struggled with that. I was trying to think should we package this up and have something where there isn't that flexibility because with perf events you you, you get to choose your own metadata. So in, in this case, you don't. So um, yeah, I think it would be worth looking at that again and seeing you know maybe maybe we should keep this a bit more generic. When you talked about um, K probes at one point, you said um, this is going to point you back to the SKB. Is it an SKB always involved, or for particular performance events, is there the ability to go straight from the event into the M mapped buffer representation and eliminate the SKB? So the way it works currently is when the the the, um, the K probe gets triggered and the BPF helper is called, um, you're, you're giving that a pointer, and that pointer is assumed at the moment to point at an SKB, um, but. The, you know, one of the things I suggested for future work is it wouldn't necessarily have to be an SKB. So if you wanted to you know, look in the RDMA subsystem and you want to take one of, one of their scatter gather lists, you could give it a parser for that effectively as well. So um, you know, it could support other, other types of And then data translate data. that directly into the PCAP format to MMAP. Yeah, exactly. So um, one, 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 one extension that would be good maybe uh, if you know that you're tracing a function that has an SKB as an argument anyway, you could inspect that via PTF. And then you can actually maybe call the actual SKB helpers to extract the data because you know That's the true, kernel yeah. is running this, so you don't have to do the BPF probe read stuff. Oh, really? Yeah, so you, you know it is, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's safe, yeah. At that point, you would know that you don't crash the kernel if you're attached to this yeah. specific function, right? Yeah. That's true, because at the moment there's a lot of um, logic in the code that has to check that it actually does look like an SKB and, and the data is valid. But mm. yeah, if we, if we could use BTF, we can, we can, we can avoid that. That's true. Hi, Michael Richardson. I'm uh, actually the TCP dump maintainer. Um, we don't currently in libpcap have a really a output pcap ng mechanism. Um, that's a bug that's probably going to get fixed in the next year. One of the reasons we don't really have a thing is that we don't really have a lot of good use cases for when we would need to dump new stuff because we don't have a huge amount of of meta information th from the kernel captures that we don't have somewheres where we've already hacked it into badly into another place. So for instance, 
directions in and out. Um, it would be so nice to know this packet was dropped. That would be such a beautiful thing to be able to say, yes, it was received, yes, it went through, yes, and it was dropped. Yeah. Or this is the unencrypted version of this encrypted packet, and we got it twice because it went through twice. So um, I would love to spend some time to figure out what the metadata that you have, stack traces, all of that stuff would be absolutely wonderful. And I think it just is exactly what we were thinking about when the PCAP NG format was created. It's like there's stuff that people want, but we don't know yet what it is. Mm. I think the drop idea is excellent. Uh, just cl be clear on semantics. Absolutely. Where was it dropped? Why was it dropped? Who dropped it? But w what does accept mean? Yes. Did, did it made it to the socket and it went to user space. Okay, I understand. Well, That's unambiguously accept. So, so one of the things that users regularly want to know is um, I want to trace this socket as traffic that came to this socket. I know the system received it, but uh, I can see that it didn't get that application didn't get it yeah. where. So that's Why? the kind of drops that people. That's wanna. that's exactly they want to know. Like, well, I screwed something up because I see the traffic yeah. coming in, and now what? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to also add, like, if you could tell me, like, where the K-free happened on individual packets, this would be huge, because there's so many times where I've done something wrong, and I'm trying to figure out exactly where the packets dropped. If you had, like, the Drop line number in Drop monitor is file, supposed to fill that gap. But can you filter on, like, I want this TCP packet with these push flags set? You right? have to do that manually. E yeah, right? But, like, a single command line, I mean, I can do it today, it's painful, but... You want this, something like this? Like that. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, uh, so you mentioned uh, something about like filtering uh, uh, packets. My question to you is like digging the, uh, a little into that specifically. Uh, at 40 gig, you know, just putting pipes into a perf pipe pretty soon, your user space is not gonna keep up just filtering. So, what thoughts do you have about like runtime, like specifying filters, especially for something like in the XTP mode? Yeah, we need a way to push a filter into the BPF program that's doing the capture. Um, you know, XTP cap did this, so I think the way they did that was, um, was interesting. They had a way of translating filters um, from classic BPF to eBPF, um, so they could do that translation and then do, so they'd have their filter and then their packet capture action. Um, so, so that's one way of doing it. So one approach I was thinking about, and I don't even know if this is feasible, would be um, to have a BPF helper um, that you could call within your program. Um, you know, at the moment we have this way of doing um, doing BPF tail calls. So you have a map populated with BPF programs, and you can tail call one of them. Um, but, you know, based on your needs. So if you populated a map like that um, with BPF filter programs, maybe we could add a helper that could call into one of those um, filter programs. But I'm not sure what the what the logistics of that are. I mean, you could you'd have to worry about recursion then, obviously. But like. The tool that you run in user space to activate this is loading a BPF program, right? Yeah. So, and we already have code to translate filters into a BPF, so you can just like, put it into the BPF program before you load it. Yeah. You put the filter in the filter. Yeah, that's like, true. So you just like, and you can like, like either, either you just rewrite the program and like sort of stuff some instructions in there to do the filtering, yeah. or you can have like BPF normal function calls now that you sort of populate a filter function dynamically yeah. when you load the program. Yeah. I think that should be doable, right? I'm looking at you guys. Yeah. Hey. Uh, I'm kind of biased. I'm the original author of XDP Cap at Cloudflare. Uh, I think one of the key things we found is that having extra metadata is really important for us. Yeah. So we pretty much only use it in XDP, but knowing what action we took on that packet is really important. Right, if we just capture yeah. a packet and don't know what we actually did with it, it's yeah. kind of, it's mostly useless to us because we know we've seen the packet, the Nick got it, and then who knows what happened to it. Yeah. Uh, and on that line in XDP, it's nice to be able to capture the packet multiple times because sometimes you get the original input packet, then you yeah. modify the packet, and it can end up completely different. Yeah. Um, and so one thing we've not quite figured out how to do yet is how to capture a packet several times and associate that it is the same packet and that we've captured it once here in its unencapsulated form and then maybe encapsulated it in a UDP packet or something to load balance it right. and being able to associate those two captures so we could search on one and find both at the same time. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think one of the things it says, um, you, you capture the packet um, as, as it comes into the program or before it's modified. I think you have to choose one so, or the other. Yeah, yeah. right yeah. now on XTP, you can only capture it in one place really once. Yeah. Because we have to run the, then we tail call into the converted CVPF filter program. Yeah. 
So, uh, it almost seems to suggest if we want to do the multiple capture thing in XCP that we really would need a helper in the end to have a, tr a trigger point. Or just some ID. Yeah, that's another way to do it. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think it would be very useful if in the BPF program that you're loading, you could specify explicit spots where you would be able to attach like TCP points. dump style yeah. um, like hooks, right? Like I want to dump here. And some metadata. And then you could do something like TCP dump dash I if zero percent XDP or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing you can do, um, I, I've been using, so in Oracle Linux we have Dtrace, um, so it's like a separate tracing framework. So one of the things, uh, Dtrace has had packet capture for a while, so, and that's how I came in, in contact with this subject. I added packet capture to that a while back. So one thing you can do is um, helper functions are kernel functions as well. So although it kind of makes your head spin, you can actually trace a uh, helper function within a BPF program as well, the same, same as it. You know, as if it was any other kernel function. So that's one way you can actually track stuff. Now, I don't know if you could do that with BPF itself. There may be some limitations on running a tracing program on a BPF program itself. But um, certainly, I guess it's theoretically possible, maybe. I'm not sure. There you go. Um, so one more comment on the filtering to add to what John was mentioning before. I think it would be super useful um, if I'm... Um, monitoring K3 SKB, for example, I want to know exactly. So I roughly know, okay, my SKB goes through this path in the kernel, mm. but I want to filter um, on specific packets. So for example, I don't know, um, some protocol, or I would like to attach maybe um, two K probes in the system um, where I know the SKP is passing through it, but it's dropped somewhere in between. Yeah. And then, for example, I could do SKB mark uh, on the SKB that I want to filter, yeah. and maybe later on unmark it again so I don't get the rest of the noise yeah. that K3 SKB is oftentimes generating. Something like this would be super useful, I think, for debugging production. Yeah. Yeah, the, I think the concept is called, um, in Dtrace, it's called speculative tracing. So the idea is that an event may happen in the future. Um, so you, you have a buffer, a special buffer set aside for that, and then you commit that buffer if the event happens, and then you discard it if it doesn't. But yeah, I think you could do the same thing with maps, though, quite easily, I, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, we would have to have some possibility to uh, maybe write into the SKB, or, or like to mark it somehow, that we want yeah. this specific one and not the rest, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like the idea presented here about multiple capturing points and collecting packets. One thing that seems missing in what you presented is that users are quite often interested in packets flowing both directions. So in your examples, you can filter only on one uh, point, mm. uh, one trace point, so you get like incoming packets only. Mm. Uh, I think what shouldn't be forget when we implement something like that is that we really want both. We want incoming sure. and going packets and both included in the same pickup file. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Oh, yeah. and by the way, there's, I think there's a limitation of TCP dump that it cannot really store the direc direction. So you cannot find out whether the packet is going in or out. So this is something that should be probably stored in the metadata as well. Yeah. Just another thought, um, it would be fairly interesting if instead of simply installing a K-probe at various points through filtering, if I could define something like a path going through the kernel and saying, I want to see all packets that went through GSO that are going through this yeah. socket that ended up being dropped. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Or if I'm doing something outwards, I want to see all packets from this socket that went outbound that ended up on Mellanox Q number X. Yeah. So yeah. it would be interesting if we could yeah. extend it that way. Yeah, I think that's where integration with um, an actual tracing tool is really useful because you can specify that at a much higher level. And I think that gives you the ability to sort of express some of those, those concepts a bit more clearly. I think what, what we're learning over time is that the art of using these technologies is finding the appropriate trace point and then using the programmability that's implicit in the technology to get what you want when you want. And so all these little awesome ideas like what John just described are going to be a matter of finding what those pieces are to put together to solve that problem. Any other questions or comments? Great. I was just 
Okay, you may promote your thing. <laughs> On the topic of like XDP and XDP dump in different places in the XDP program, you should all come to our talk tomorrow morning about how we're going to do different XD multiple XDP programs on one interface in sequence. Okay, so if you're interested, come see that tomorrow morning. Okay. Oh, one more. One more thought. So if you build tools that are uh, basically using different trace points to c capture packets, mm. uh, and then later the kernel is changed, so those, uh, I mean, you can use either, either the trace points or just like use probes. Uh, K-probes are trace points. Yeah. yeah. So if you, if you use just arbitrary, tr uh, arbitrary probes, then we probably don't have guarantee that the, the packet capturing tool will work with future kernels, yeah. which is something that probably is not acceptable to the users, I think. Yeah. So it might not be that easy, I'm yeah. afraid. Yeah. We don't want that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you.